This is our VPP video for our Lesson 1 vocabulary words. Our first word is fatalistic. The sentence that we're going to use to figure out what it means is the following. The fatalistic historian claims that we are unable to control the outcomes of future events. First of all, let's talk about part of speech. Fatalistic is located in the sentence right before the noun historian. This is telling us what kind of historian we're dealing with. So it's modifying or making more specific the type of historian in the sentence. So that means fatalistic is going to be an adjective. So let's talk about the meaning here. If you look at the word fatalistic, the word fate comes to mind. And that's our context clue as to what this sentence or what this word means. Also look at the rest of the sentence. Unable to control the outcomes of future events. That's pretty much the definition of fatalistic. It's a pretty pessimistic way of looking at things because someone who is fatalistic believes that all events in life are inevitable, meaning there's nothing you can do about it and determined by fate. Here's a quote to kind of help us remember what fatalistic means. A fatalistic attitude prevents people from accepting responsibility for their position in life. They attribute success and failure to luck. They resign themselves to their fate. So they're not really going to work hard to change things because they feel like no matter what they do or say, it's not going to work out. Our next word is elated. This is a lot more positive than fatalistic. And it's also an adjective. Now, it's not right next to the noun. It's modifying because it has a linking verb connecting it to the noun. But it's, it is an adjective because it's telling us something about the politicians. The politicians were elated after learning the positive election results. So look at, towards the end of the sentence, the word positive. That tells us that elated is a good thing. The politicians have won the election, so obviously they're going to be very happy about that. So that's what elated means. In high spirits, exultantly proud and joyful, a synonym would be overjoyed, an obvious antonym would be depressed. So a picture to help us remember what elated is, is from last year, our Varsity football team won the state championship, and so here we have a picture of Coach Kaiser, we have a picture of Josh Tolbert and Connor Holden holding the trophy up, and they were obviously elated um, over winning this championship, the milestone that we achieved um, in our sports program here at Southside Christian. Our next word is pensive. We have a lot of adjectives in this lesson, and here we have another one. Instead of taking immediate action to correct the problem, Mary became pensive and vague. So this is the opposite context clue, because instead of doing something to fix whatever the problem is, she's pensive about it. If you are pensive about something, you are dreamily thoughtful. Now, don't think about daydreaming. Just focus on the thoughtful part. I would probably just even take out dreamily. Just think about somebody who's really pondering, they're meditating, they're reflecting on what they should do. So they're not rushing into action because they want to weigh the pros and cons before they go ahead and do something that they're going to regret. The, op the opposite would be somebody who's silly or frivolous because they're acting in a way which shows they are not being thoughtful before they make their decision. So for pensive, I actually have two pictures. One, obviously, is the President of the United States. He has a pensive look on his face. He's pondering, probably, um, a decision he has to make about something of importance with our country, which, of course, all presidents have to do. Now, the second picture, if you're a Harry Potter fan like I am, you'll recognize this. If not, let me explain what this is. Harry, at this point in one of the novels, is looking into what J.K. Rowling called the pensive and I'm pretty confident here that she took pensive and um, took the word pensive and combined it with sieve and so what the pensive was in the novels was an opportunity for Harry to examine the thoughts and memories of other characters in the story because the characters would siphon their memories, um, would filter them from their minds, and they would go into this bowl and then Harry could look and find out things from the past, Dumbledore's thoughts, Snape's thoughts, etc. So a combination of being thoughtful and then sieve, which is like a siphon, like a filter. 
Our next word is licentious, another adjective. This time it's right before the noun it's modifying, and unfortunately, this is true many times in our country and around the world with our political system. Licentious politicians lower a country's moral reputation in the world. The context clue that's going to help us figure out what this means is the word moral. Okay, and they're lowering the moral standard. So obviously licentious is negative, and it means somebody who's morally unrestrained, meaning they don't care what's right or what's wrong. They're going to do whatever they feel like doing. Immoral is a synonym. Lewd, um, vulgar, any of those types of words would fit. The opposite would be chaste or pure. Even the word holy would be the opposite. So you might laugh when you see this picture and hopefully you're not offended but Miley Cyrus I put her as an example because she was this sweet little Hannah Montana character on the Disney Channel and then in the last several years she has exhibited a lot of immoral or licentious behavior so hopefully she'll change and um, maybe the Holy Spirit will get a hold of her our next word is lackadaisical Yet another adjective, do not become lackadaisical when collecting honey from a beehive or the bees will sting you. This is the cause and effect context clue strategy. So if you're lackadaisical when collecting from a honey or collecting honey from the beehive, the bees are going to sting you. So that means you're not really paying attention to what's going on around you. And then a negative result is going to happen. So you're uninterested, you're listless, you're spiritless, apathetic. We use that word a lot talking about our spiritual condition. Languid. Okay, you're just kind of in your own world and you're not paying attention to what's going on around you. Lazy would be another good adjective for lackadaisical. The opposite would be enthusiastic or inspired. So this picture is kind of silly, but we've got a guy who's so lazy that he has devised a way to get his plate to stick to his shirt so that he then can lie down on the couch and not even use a fork to eat his spaghetti or his food. He just lies there and slurps it up. That is the really <laughs> ultimate picture of laziness. Somebody who can't even sit up and use a utensil to eat their food. Lackadaisical. Our next word is alienate. And we finally have a word that's not an adjective. In fact, this is a verb because you're doing something when you alienate others. In this case, we have a student and a teacher context. A bad attitude alienates your teachers. You know, if you have a bad attitude towards me or towards any of your other high school teachers, we're not going to want to really have anything to do with you too much. Um, because you have turned away feelings or affections, you've estranged yourself from us, you've set yourself against us. Now, obviously, as Christian teachers, we're not going to just uh, ignore you. We're going to hopefully help you change your attitude. Um, the opposite would be to endear or unite. Now, a lot of time we use a lot of times we use this word in a friendship context you're going to alienate yourself from your friends if you talk about them behind their backs, if you gossip, if you break your promises, etc. So here's a picture and it's kind of comical, but this poor little girl has this perplexed look on her face. She's despondent because the girls in front of her are, are talking about her most likely. And so she feels alienated from them. She feels like she's not a part of the group and that is not a good feeling to have. Our next word is paucity. This time we actually have a noun. This is a word you probably haven't heard of. John realized that the paucity of money would prevent him from buying an expensive car. So this is also cause and effect context clue strategy, strategy similar to lackadaisical because one thing results in another. So in this case, he doesn't have enough money, so he can't buy that expensive car that he wants. So if you have a paucity of something, that means you have a scarcity a lack of something. You all probably feel like you have a paucity of money and you can't get everything that you want. Insufficiency would be a synonym. The opposite would be abundance. Here's a picture. This is probably Great Depression era America. You see these poor little kids here and they've got empty cups just showing that they have a paucity of um, 
nutrients to feed them during this time in American history when so many people were lacking in just their basic needs. Now, most of us here, even though sometimes we feel like we have a paucity of resources, that is so untrue um, compared to the majority of the rest of the world. Our next word is obtrude, and we're going to have another verb here, an action word. When a matador is fighting a bull, enthusiastic fans must remember not to obtrude themselves into the ring, because if they do obtrude, then obviously they're going to get hurt. If you obtrude yourself into a situation, you are forcing yourself into a situation uninvited. You're not supposed to be there. You're imposing. You're intruding. The opposite is extricate. If you extricate yourself from a situation, you remove yourself. You take yourself out of the equation, so to speak. So, obviously we're not going to have common situations with bullfighting. But here's another Harry Potter scenario, which I think really illustrates obtrude. If you know this story, you know this teacher here, Dolores Umbridge at Hogwarts, and most people can't stand her. And she is a horrible um, person. And she's constantly obtruding herself into Harry's business along with his friends. And she has her little minions in the back, meaning Draco Malfoy and his gang, because, of course, they want her to obtrude into Harry's business to get him in trouble because they're enemies. So if you obtrude, you really are not minding your own business. You're getting into a situation that you know people don't want you there. All right, our next word is probably one you haven't heard yet, unless you do this for a hobby. Numismatist is how you pronounce it, and it is a noun. Every adventurous numismatist loves to discover rare coins. So basically, the context clue here is the definition. The definition is pretty much in the sentence, and it has to do with coins, and it's somebody who collects coins. A numismatist is a coin collector. Maybe some of you guys do that, and you didn't realize you were a numismatist. Maybe you have a collection of the state quarters. And so here I have a picture of some coins, and this person is examining a coin, and you see the magnifying glass there so that they can get a closer look at it. Numismatist. One more word. Epigram, another noun. Epigrams yield concise and clever truths. So the definition is in the sentence itself. An epigram is a witty saying expressing a single thought or observation. I'll give you an example of one in a minute on the next slide so you can understand it better. A synonym is aphorism. We're actually going to have that later this year as one of our vocabulary words. A French synonym would be bon mot. And then a quip, and then quip would be the next Synonym. Picture here is an epigram from Benjamin Franklin. A penny saved is a penny earned. He was famous for a lot of epigrams, and you'll learn more about them when you take American hist or American lit in tenth grade with Mrs. Bennett. So these are our words for lesson one. Don't forget to sign the honor pledge that you have watched this video on the exercise one homework.